Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. I wonder, have you ever heard the question, if God exists, why do we have evil in the world? If God is loving, why does he permit evil to exist? I've encountered a lot of people that have used that as an excuse to reject the existence of God because they see so much evil in the world. And it's hard for them to believe that an almighty, loving God, uh, if that God existed, how could he? How could they possibly allow all this evil to go on? Well, let me try to answer that question today. This may be seem shocking to some of you, but I want you to know that personally, I am thankful that God allows evil to exist. That's right. I am thankful God allows evil to exist. Before I make the conclusion and support that statement, uh, it's important we understand a little scripture. I'm going to read first from Romans chapter 3. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, some of you might be thinking, yeah, that's talking about the evil people. Uh, but let's not ignore the fact that it says they are all under sin. Jews and Gentiles, all people. For your information, anyone who is not Jewish, the remaining people are all classified as Gentiles. So if we say Jews and Gentiles, that means all the people of the world. They are all under sin. That means every one of us goes on to say, there is none righteous, no, not one. You see, if you're watching this now, you are not righteous. It says no one is righteous, not even one. That includes you. That includes me. That includes every person. So, when it says about all these horrible things that they do, that's talking about us. They, uh, it says they, their tongues have used deceit. Have you ever been deceitful? Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Have you ever been bitter, cursing? Their feet are swift to shed blood. 
Maybe you've shed blood, maybe you haven't. But Jesus said, even if you hate someone, you're guilty of murder because you've murdered them in your mind and in your heart. So I've noticed that there is a uh, common uh, concept today of basically kind of moral relativity and uh, a, a kind of a sliding scale of uh, judging other people, how good they are. Some people think that they're very good because they're comparing themselves to other people. And, you, you know, if you look hard enough, you can always find some people that, in your eyes, are worse than you. They've done horrible things that you wouldn't do. But then there's another person that might say, you're the horrible person, uh, that they would never do the things that you've done. So, if we compare ourselves to other people, we can fool ourselves, we deceive ourselves into thinking that we're pretty good people. It's, it's like the Pharisee and the tax collector. And Jesus told the story about the Pharisee that went to the temple and he pray, prayed out loud, Oh Lord, I'm th thankful that I'm not like these other people. You know, I do good things. I pay my tithes and I fast and right? and then there was another person praying he was a lowly tax collector but Jesus said he wouldn't even lift up his eyes to God he just bent over and said God have mercy on me a sinner he was humble and he was honest about himself he knew that he was a sinner and he just prayed, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said that it was the second man that would be justified, not the first who was full of spiritual pride. And that's how man is typically. We think too much of ourselves. This verses I just read, it wasn't talking about some rare individuals who are fit this description it says we're all under sin no one is righteous not even the one and in verse 23 it says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god so you see if you want to measure yourself against other people. You might think you come out smelling like a rose. But God doesn't measure you to other, other people. God measures you to Jesus Christ. And when you get measured against Jesus Christ, it says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ is God Almighty manifest in the flesh. Scripture says that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He came down from heaven and became a man. And he came down from heaven so he could die for our sins. But while he lived, he lived a perfect life with no sin. And he set the standard of perfection. So rather than comparing yourselves to other people and patting yourself on the back, Compare yourself to Jesus Christ. If this is Jesus Christ's level of perfection, never sinned one time, and you're one of these people like me and everybody else in the world, that we've, no one is righteous. No matter how hard we try to work our way up to perfection, we can't do it. We all fall short of the glory of God. Jesus represents the glory of God, perfection. We all fall short. So this is important to understand that uh, all of mankind is evil. We only have good and evil. 
Right? Man wants to have degrees in between good and evil, varying degrees. But in God's eyes, there's only good, there's only evil. And you're not good. I'm not good. Scripture says, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Jesus said that only God is good. Now let's look at 1 John chapter 1. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. You see, some people think that because they see other people that they perceive as worse than them, that that makes them pretty good. But the Bible says we've all sinned. All of us have sinned. And if you can't admit that you're a sinner, that you are also evil, you might say, well, that's pretty harsh. That's pretty extreme. Well, in God's sight, there's only perfection and everything else. And everything else is evil. You're either good or you're not good. And the scripture says you're not good. And I'm not good. Only God is good. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is the first thing we, may, we must understand is that we are not good in God's eyes. We are sinners and we need to understand that and admit it. Be truthful with yourself, it says. Now, however, it says, if we confess our sinfulness, it says if we confess our sins, which means if we confess that we indeed are sinners in need of forgiveness and a savior. It says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So even though all of mankind is sinful, all of mankind is evil, if we confess to God that I'm a sinner, I need forgiveness, I need Jesus to be my Savior. It says we get forgiveness and we're cleansed of our unrighteousness. However, in verse 10 it says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, Why does God allow evil to exist in the world? Well, if we understand what evil is, instead of thinking evil is just this maniac that you know, killed a bunch of people in the church or someone else who killed a bunch of people at an elementary school or the, the most popular examples of, of uh, Jeffrey Dahmer or Adolf Hitler. Well, it's clear to everybody they're evil. But it needs to be clear to you that you are evil and I am evil. In God's sight, no one is righteous. No one is good. Only God is good. Only God is righteous. We all fall short. And you can use a sliding scale if you want and say, I'm not as bad as the next guy, but you're unfit. No matter how good you think you may be, you're unfit. So, why am I happy that God allows evil to exist? If he did not allow evil to exist, if he removed all evil from the world, you would have to be terminated. I would have to be terminated. Everyone would. Let's look at 2 Peter 3.9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Well, this was written because at that time, people were saying, why doesn't the Lord return? We expect the Lord to return. He hasn't returned yet. This was written in the, the first century. And here we are in the 21st century. He still hasn't returned. Thank you, Jesus, for not returning. Thank you, for Jesus, for not eliminating all evil. Because November 19, 1950, I was born. And if you returned before that, I wouldn't be here. And if you eliminated evil before, before I believe in Jesus, then I would have had to been eliminated too. And yes, you too, you watching right now. If you really wanted God to eliminate evil, then you're asking for him to eliminate you. So it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, his promise to return and, and set things right and give us, you know, heaven on earth. But it says it, he is long suffering. He's patient toward us. He's being patient. He's extending more time so that people can come to their senses and realize that, thank you, Jesus, for allowing evil to exist because you allowed me to exist until I, I saw that I had a chance to come to repentance. And repentance means changing your mind, getting, getting over yourself. Stop thinking that you're good and that you somehow may go to heaven because you're good. Just get over that. Change your mind. A acknowledge the fact that that you are not good and I'm not good. Only God is good. We all fall short. And thank, be thankful that God has extended time for you to come to your senses. He says, he is long suffering to us. He is patient. He's being patient with us. As evil as we all are, He's being patient. He says, not willing that any should perish. He does not desire that any of us should perish. Perish means that our fate is not heaven, but our fate would be the lake of fire, the second death. He doesn't want you to perish in the lake of fire. He wants you to come to repentance. That means change your mind about your goodness and your personal merit and, and thinking that evil is somewhere else. Realize evil is within you and be thankful he allowed that evil to exist long enough for you to come to your senses and repent. Change your mind and say, yes, I am a sinner in need of a savior and know that there is one savior one who can save you. His name is Jesus Christ, God Almighty, manifest in the flesh. He died for our sins. He raised himself from the dead to prove he does have the power over life and death. And he will give you life everlasting if you put your faith in him and stop believing that you're good and that other people are evil. So that's why I am thankful that God does allow evil to exist. And if you're one of these people that uses that as an objection to not believe in God, not believe in the Bible, saying that if God really exists, how can he allow evil to exist? He's allowing you to exist so that you have time to come to your senses and put your faith in this Savior, Jesus. Will you do it today? If you put your faith in Jesus today, please make a comment and let me know. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.